tools um, that you'll be using really commonly, and then start to actually get into the real meat of writing code. So we have an hour and a half left, and um, we still have some flexibility in the next class to go over control flow if we don't get to it this time. But I think we can. I think we can get really close. So what I'm going to do for those of you that have Git troubles is I'm going to again compress the next uh, playground and place that on Slack. So you should grab it. Yeah, it turns it from a folder into a single file, and then that's easier to upload to Slack. So I just right click and hit uh, compress. Also, I put I uh, zip the folder, the entire folder. And I you can do that too. I put it in place. I put it in Dropbox. Oh, okay. And sorry, there's a link on Slack. For Dropbox. Oh, you already did it. Yeah. Oh, look at that. <laughs> All right, never mind. Thank you very much. Um, so all of you should download that instead and not do my silly, not follow along with my silly. This, this lesson three four. Um, if you if you don't have it already synced to your own. Oh, it doesn't open. Oh, sorry. Okay. Strings. Um, I'm still trying to work on this like workflow of going back and forth between so, like, full screen mode and not full screen mode. Anyway. Strings. String, a string is the next data type that we're going to talk about. A string is, represents a sequence of characters. So this is the primary means that we represent text, essentially, is a string. Um, the syntax is two double quotes and then a bunch of characters in between. So we start a string like this hello world string here, a double quote, then we can write pretty much anything we want and then another double quote to close the string. So this is the first data type where it's a syntax that's probably unfamiliar to you if you haven't coded before. It's a very common paradigm to try to represent text. So um, the notable difference is right here, the double quote surrounding the 1.0. That is not a double quote. That's a string. That's three different characters after each other, one after another. Um, oh, thanks. So, 1.0 is a double. I made a mistake here. I keep conflating float and double because in my in my last job uh, we never said double. It was always float 32 or float 64. Um, so, forgive me. I'll correct all of these. But um, the 1.0 is a double. The quote 1.0 quote is a string has nothing to do with doubleness at all, even though it looks like it. Does it make sense? It's just a string that holds something that looks like a double. So in our playground, if you open up the strings playground, you should see this. Um, this is a string that has the word hello in it. This is that print line function that I told you about before. This is the thing that, this is a function call um, where we have this symbol print line, and then an open parenthesis, then a string inside of it, and then a closed parenthesis. So this is both Xcode and Playground compatible. So whenever we put this into an app in Xcode, it'll show up in, the con in our debug console in the Xcode. The Xcode. So um, the thing that so we're going to we're going to practice with this here in a second. Um, but the thing that I want you to come away with this is not just the syntax of strings, quote a bunch of stuff and then another quote. It's the fact that strings themselves have a different set of operations that come along with them, a different set than integers and doubles. Even though that syntax might look exactly the same. So, in this case, the meaning of the plus sign has now changed because it doesn't have numeric types on either side of it. It has strings on both sides of it. Does that make sense? You have a string and a plus and a string. So now the plus no longer means addition. We 
actually can't add two strings together. The notion of addition doesn't make sense for strings. That operation in the string world we call concatenation. It means that I have hello, H-E-L-L-O, comma, space, and now I'm going to take that second string, W-O-R-L-D, exclamation, and put them together into one string. Does that make sense? So the result of this operation is this guy right here. So these two, as far as Swift is concerned, are the same. One requires some computation, the hello world, and the other doesn't. So what I'd like you to do is just type, is just get used to typing strings. So say hello and then type someone's name. And I want you to notice a behavior that happens here in the playground. As when you type that first double quote, it actually, and you start typing, notice how it has another double quote already kind of grayed out, sort of pre-inserted afterwards. That's giving you a hint as to what to do in order to make that appropriate syntax. You see how it's still gray, but it's still evaluating properly over here? The playground is smart enough even though it's dumb. It's just smart enough to figure out that eventually you mean to close that string and put a quote there. So it'll do it for you in order to, in order to create a valid piece of syntax that we can compute. So as I'm typing, and if I wait a little bit, it'll recompute for me, even though I haven't typed that, that second double quote. So then I can double quote, and now I finish all the Another behavior that's really nifty is if I'm typing and then I hit the right arrow key, highlights, it tells me that it has typed in that double quote form. Another behavior that you should be aware of, up here on the print line statement, see how my cursor is just to the right of that closing parenthesis? If I hit left and then right again, Notice how it's highlighting that other parenthesis for me. It's telling me which one is matched to that closing parenthesis. So, let's type another string. But use the print line function. Type in P-R-I-N-T-L-N, an open parenthesis, and then watch the fact that it gives you an error. And even click on that little dot and see what it says. Expect a comma separator. That is not correct. That little error thing is going to be the bane of my existence in teaching some of this stuff. But type in a quote and just type a farewell. And then try to close, and then just by typing, create a, a appropriate or complete the syntax. So turn this into a syntactically correct statement. So Sean, what would I do to make this syntactically correct? Uh, good quotes and then right friends. Quotes and then right friends. Aha! Excellent. Goodbye. Um, type in print line and then a mathematical expression, 1 plus 2, and close it. I want you to see what happens. So, in the, result, in the results pane, notice how everything that was a string over there is also represented as a string with these double quotes. The 3 is also represented as a string over here. So print line 1 plus 2 gives you quote 3 quote. We just, Eric and I just noticed that some of you running older versions of Xcode, older meaning like, you know, what version? Wait, six point, we're on 6.3, and then 6.2 is the previous one if you haven't updated recently. Right? So if you're running 6.2, you might actually be seeing different results over here. You actually might be seeing the point .0 after the number three. So congratulations for that. Um, Swift is in constant development, and so are Playgrounds and Xcode. It has a kind of unsettling beta feel to it. Um, you can code through it and eventually get an app on the App Store. It is possible. It's just there are some moments that are kind of that are kind of uh, weird. It's kind of like stalling your car. You just have to like know how to get it back in the gear. Um, so does it turn it into See, that's the thing that's rather unusual, is that it's not really a string because it's not really a piece of data that we can get to anymore. Like this, 
quote, three quote, like, there's no way that I can, I can get to that value right. with this particular not, function. Because you're not storing it at all. That's right. I'm not storing a value. All I'm doing is telling the, the environment, telling, um, in this case, the playground, that I want to display this value over here. See, the quotes don't show up here, so the fact that it just says goodbye means that it's probably a string, but if I have um, an integer in there too, it doesn't, I can't tell the difference. Can you store a fun like the result of a function in a variable? Yes, you can. Well, wouldn't it, wouldn't it have to be an integer based on the, the uh, arithmetic that's going on inside the parentheses? Yeah, I'm just trying to call out the fact that there's very little over here to tell you types through that function. But I wanted you to get used to just typing typing this function, the print line function. Because this guy is going to be your best friend when we start coding apps. Your very best friend. Yes. I just tried something. Um, oh, what did you try? So Tell I us. did um, print line um, quote one and quote plus quote two and quote and then it combined uh -huh. That's right. So you actually concatenated two strings and printed the result. Um, so here, so here, I get one two. I get twelve instead of instead of what one plus two would have given us, which is three. Yes. But okay, but if you were to store the print line thing into a variable, if you're allowed to do that, isn't that where doesn't print line like return something? And now it's putting in no. No, it does not, just, doesn't have a return value. We'll okay, get to that. We'll, we'll, get to, we'll get to variables in a few minutes. Okay, but we don't know what that, the quotes around the three, we don't know what that is. We don't know if it's a number or a string. Um, or as, far as, as far as the playground is concerned, it, does, it doesn't know as far as the results. Okay. The results that we're getting over here. So, um, so there's some things that you can trust and some things that you, that you can't um, in terms of types. Generally, um, it actually turns out not to matter all that much, luckily enough, because what we're using the print line for is to help us introspect inside running code. So if you're in an app and you're iterating over a set of tweets, and there's one tweet that you're getting that's totally screwed, that like throws an error, it doesn't display properly or whatnot, one debugging procedure is to put a print line statement inside that loop and figure out what's different about that one tweet versus the others. So it's, uh, it's sometimes what developers like to refer to as poor man's debugging. Um, okay, strings make sense. We're not going not to talk about any other operations for strings right now, just because it's it can get compli it can get complicated, and we need um, object syntax to get to it. But concatenation is one of those that's important because you're going to be doing it a lot, and it's a diff it's the same syntax as addition, but it has a different meaning. Um, okay, there's one. Nope, not gonna show it to you. So that's strings. So open the open the Booleans playground and kind of keep it there with you. I know, I know, I know. There's a way to do this more. Than I just don't know how to do it. But I'll figure it out for next week. So you have. You'll see this. So, just to sort of follow along with the slides. So, numeric types, very mathematical, very familiar syntax. Strings probably somewhat new. They look like quotations that you would read in, in text in a, in a novel or something like that, but it's a way that we represent chunks of arbitrary text. This is the place where we start to get into more uh, computer science-y territory. Uh, this type called a Boolean. A Boolean is a type that represents trueness and this notion of trueness and falseness. So it's generally used for the type of reasoning that we're going to encounter later on. So the kind of reasoning where we're going to uh, try to ascertain whether a particular condition is true or not. There are only two values that come along with a Boolean type, and they are true and false. So these are also known, uh, remember when I went, mentioned keywords before, words that are specific to the language that we can't override. These are the two symbol, these are the two keywords for those two Boolean values.
values, true and false. So just like we have 1, 2, 3, negative 1, 3.141, and strings have double quote, blah, double quote. You only, for Booleans, you only have to worry about these two keywords, true and false. Um, so, the particular thing about Booleans is we start to use them to create um, reasoning. So we can use them to represent whether a particular fact is true or a particular fact is false. Um, numeric types and Booleans kind of live together. They kind of, they have a very close relationship to each other in that there's a set of operators that, first of all, that we learned before, that turn numeric types into other numeric types. So one plus one gives you two. And in type land, we say that an integer plus an integer gets you an integer. Remember that? There are also a set of operators that are logical operators, as opposed to arithmetic operators. So we have an integer and a logical operator and an integer, and we get a boolean. Luckily enough, you're already used to this from mathematics as well. So these are operators like less than and greater than. Remember, the fact that 3 is greater than 1 is something that we learned when we were really little. Um, in Swift, luckily enough, we have the advantage of syntax that mimics that, uh, that um, uh, mathematical expression that we learned before. We also have the ability to express less than or equal to using um, in this case, an angle, or well, in some case what we call an angle bracket, but in this case, a uh, less than sign and an equal sign, or greater than or equal to for a greater than, uh, with a greater than sign and an equal sign. We can have an operator that tells us whether two numbers are equal or not. So in this case, double equals three equals equals three. That takes an integer and an integer and produces true or false afterwards. And then inequality, which is typically in mathematics represented by an equal sign with a slash through it, um, in this case is an exclamation mark and equals. So if you go to the playground, you should be able to see all of those listed out. So in this case, true and false do indeed equal themselves, true and false. These are what we call binary comparison binary comparison operators. So binary means they take two things. So one, so the plus sign for integers is also binary in the fact that it takes two integers. So in this case, we're asking the computer to compute three less than one. And it tells us that that's false. Not so dumb after all, I suppose. But, so it's evaluating this as an operator. So it's very important to think about this in terms of not a statement of fact, but a statement of uh, query, almost. So we're asking it, just like when we say three plus one, we're asking it to compute the number four out of that, or, or it results in the number four out of that. In this case, the operator, less than, takes three and one and produces this value, false, out of that. So do all of these make sense to everyone? These sorts of operators? What's the last? The last one, right here, this is inequality. So if we're asking the computer to compute whether three is no, not equal to not three. Equal. Yeah, not equal to three. So that is false. Is three indeed equals three? It's very philosophical. Yes? Do you only need two, um, two equal signs, not three? Some, some said that precisely. Right. We'll talk about that later when we start talking about objects. That, that notion of um, equality versus identity. But in this case, we'll, uh, we're just having to deal with the double equals and the, and the exclamation equals, or bang equals. But would it say that if, well, I'll just toss it around, I'm sorry. Go for it. Okay. And it's always the exclamation in front of the equal. That's right. If you start typing in, if you start typing in the other, It'll start to hopefully it'll give us a real error and not like you know you missed a comma. Yeah, use of unresolved identifier. So all of these things, I have a feeling that there's one guy at Apple who knows what they all do. It's like it means something for him or her, and uh, and the rest of us are just kind of like what? 
<laughs> um, so some of this terminology we'll have to go over later when you become more fast with this stuff, because some of it actually makes sense, and, and, uh, and some of it doesn't. Um, if ever you get a number here next to the error, that means that there's more than one error. So it means that you've done, you've done something terribly, terribly wrong, um, because it's twice as wrong as it would have been otherwise. Um, if that's, that's a joke. So, does this make sense? Producing a, like taking an, taking an integer and another integer, producing a boolean out of it. And that boolean represents its truthness or falseness. Okay. Do, just, yes. I'm probably getting into this. Um, but do you use these a lot with like, I don't know if there would be like if, state, if statements? That's but like, yeah. right, exactly right. come off. So, okay. we're going to use them in two contexts. Um, the, the whole context is this notion of control flow, which we'll go over. Um, but the context is, I'm able to actually make decisions and execute code now under different conditions because I can, I can, I can test now whether something is true or whether something is false, and I can act differently accordingly. Um, the last bit of this is this notion of a binary Boolean operator. So these guys. So here in the next slide. So in this case. Boolean operators take one or two booleans and produce another boolean. So remember how when we said integer um, is the name of a type, but we call it an int um, because of this shorthand uh, notation? It's the same thing for booleans. So boolean is somewhat long. So the actual Swift designation for this type, but we're actually typing it in code, is bool, B O O L. So they're ultimately synonymous. So when we say bool or boolean, it's the same exact thing. This type of truthness or falseness. Um, here we can actually start to extend our Boolean vocabulary and start to um, make more complex logical statements. So those of you that have taken logic or symbolic logic before, you probably recognize some of these. But in this case, these are operators that are actually very embedded deeply into how computer processors work. There's actually circuits that are um, uh, designed to compute these things at a very low level. It's not necessarily what's happening here, but these start to form the building blocks of actual microprocessor logic, which is kind of cool, right? Um, because we can actually mimic that logic in code. So in this case, we have this operator AND, which is two ampersands next to each other, which only evaluates to true if both the left-hand side, this side, and the right-hand side are also equal to true. So it kind of makes sense when you start to you start to um, say it out loud. So this and this um, are true. This and that, right? Or this is two pipes together, which I learned recently is a character that was only invented in the land of computers. This actually has no syntactic value in English or any other written language. Um, so the two pipes, um, only this expression only evaluates to true if the left-hand side or the right-hand side is true. So true and true, is, true or true is true. True or false is false. False or true is true. Sorry. No, true, true, or and, false. true or false is true. False or false. False or true is true. And false or false is false. Can you explain how the computer evaluates it? No, no. <laughs> Later. <laughs> Um, there's this last operator, which is what we call a unary operator. It only acts on one value, which is an exclamation mark by itself. So this starts to become syntactically equivalent to the exclamation mark equals by convention. But in this case, it'll take any expression on the right, which, is a, which evaluates to a Boolean expression, and flip it from true to false, or fall, and, and false to true. A note about parentheses. Um, I find, value, I find really complex logical expressions very difficult to um, reason about if I don't use parentheses. The order of operations is not immediately obvious to me. For some reason, my brain just can't compute it properly. Like, I can't read it and think about it. So I highly recommend that you use parentheses when you start to use multiple and or operators together. Because you're going to get in these situations where you're like, where you're trying to evaluate whether multiple things are true at the same time. And 
parentheses will be your friend. So in the playground, if you go there, you'll see all of these demonstrated. And a little bit of English about how we say it out loud. So the and operator. One is one less than three, and three less than five. So any notion as to why I might want to evaluate something like this? Anyone? Why would I, does this, does this kind of make sense in some ways? What, am I, what would I be testing for here, do you think? Two different like results. That's true. There are two different results. From one less than three, three less than five. Like yeah. When I'm looking at this, I'm just thinking of like when I'm putting in like SQL queries, like is is member ID equal like we assign like industry codes to everything, so you're like pulling manufacturing member counts. Mm -hmm. And like so that would be exactly. what I'm like thinking of. I'm like translating that. That's right. So in your experience with writing SQL queries, um, did you ever have to evaluate um, a date range? Like whether certain dates happened at a, whether a certain date like happened between. If a member joined between a campaign date and then we can assign it as paid That's value. Right. And how would you express that? So, I guess you would say um, if date range is greater than like March 1st or less than like, you know, December of last year. Would you really say or? Or would you say and? And, and yeah. That's right. So this is a common pattern that we would use to test for in-betweenness. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that those values, 3 and 3, were always the same. Um, this could be a way to test whether, whether that value shows up between the numbers 1 and 5, for example. So if you're trying to test an interval, what you often do when you're doing graphics, like, is this point in between these other two points? If you're doing gaming, like, did this ball end up with, like on the paddle, for example? Like if I have a paddle game that's where there's a bouncing ball, I might want to test whether that ball's X position came between the end of the paddle and the other end of the paddle. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this is this operator and comes in very handy when you're trying to evaluate situations like that. But that's what, like the three would be the variable that you're trying to actually that's test. Right. Assuming that that three was yeah, that, that three was always the same. Yeah. So if this was 2.5, and then 2.5, right? Um, the OR operator works very much the same way. The NOT, the not operator just flips the logic. So 3 is less three is less than 1, is false. But then when I put the NOT operator on it, it, it evaluates to true. Note how I'm using parentheses just out to help to help Swift um, understand, or for me to be very explicit about what I want to be nodding, which is the single expression that comes after the not, the, the, uh, the exclamation mark, the bang operator. Okay. Does that make sense, for more or less? So Booleans, I find Booleans much easier to understand once I start to put them into context. So let's, let's take another step forward and start to create that context for ourselves. So we've gone over the fundamental types that we're going to be dealing with. We've gone over integers, floats, doubles, strings, and booleans, or bools. What I want to show you now actually starts to get into the meat of programming itself. So open variables.playground. And just keep it holding there while I go through some of the terminology that we're going to be um, uh, dealing with, with variables and constants. So, a bunch of you already know what variables are. Um, they come generally from mathematics. So when you started taking algebra, you started working with variables, mostly x, y, and z, and a, b, and c. Um, and uh, so, computer programming takes the very same approach, although the symbols that we can use don't have to be a single letter, luckily enough. They can be as long as we want, practically speaking. Um, but Swift gives us a little bit of a twist that uh, some of you that are programming for might not be accustomed to. So in Swift, there are two ways to store data. And um, the first is a typical variable, what we normally think of as a variable in any 
any other programming language. Variable is just, variable is just a symbol that represents uh, the, what we call a changeable state of a particular time. So let me tell you what that is. Um, it's a symbol like x, y, or z from algebra that holds a value of a particular type. So if, in algebra, if I say the value x is equal to 1.1, that in algebra, I can use that letter x to then represent 1.1 wherever I want in any statement afterwards, right? If I'm solving a quadratic equation, if I'm evaluating a, 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 a unit conversion from Fahrenheit to Celsius, for example, I can use that, I can use that variable x to represent a piece of data that can potentially change, right? So in computer programming, we have to be very careful, at least in Swift, we have to be very careful about the fact that a variable, a symbol, or a word that we're using has to, is going to represent a value, but it's all but that value must be of a particular type. We have to be explicit about that or implicit about that. But the distinction that I'm making here between variables and constants is that the value of a variable can change, but the value of a constant, which is also a symbol that holds a value of a particular type, that can never change once it's created. So if I create x as a variable, I can put 1.1 into it, I can put 3.6 into it, I can then change it, I can subtract 1 from it, I can do all sorts of stuff to whatever that value is. But a constant, if I set a constant c that equals 299 million, it will always equal 299 million. And Swift won't let me change it anymore, ever. OK? Does that make sense? Variables, symbols that hold values, that can change. Constants, symbols that hold values, but they never change. OK. So how do we work with variables? Um, variables are have two operate or three operations that we can perform on. We have to tell Swift that we want to use a particular symbol in the program that we're about to run. So that process of letting Swift know that the variable is coming to it and we're about to use it is called declaration. We're going to declare a variable to Swift. So um, variables are declared by using the keyword var. VAR -V makes sense. It's going to be a variable, so we're going to tell Swift that, that whatever symbol that we put after VAR is going to be something that will become meaningful for it in all of the lines that come after that piece of code. It's very template like here and very abstract, it'll become more concrete in the next uh, slide. The second process after we declare a variable is called initialization. If a variable is declared, it immediately is created and becomes meaningful, and we, and, but it doesn't actually contain a value yet. Remember, variables are symbols that hold values of a particular type, so we have to tell it both things. We have to tell it what, that, what its first value is going to be and what type that value is. Initialization. So we declare a variable, then we initialize it. Okay. That syntax... The value and the type. Both. Simultaneously at the same time. So here's some examples. <coughs> var x equals 1. Var is a keyword that is meaningful to Swift and we can never use it in any other way. X is something that we choose, this symbol that we want to be able to use and redeploy and store values in however we want. An equal sign, which indicates that we're about to initialize that variable, and then a value. So in this syntax, this is what's called implicit typing. So we give it the number one. The number one is an integer. Therefore, x can only hold integers after we declare. Does that make sense? Is it only the integer one or any integer? Any integer. Because it's var, we can change uh, yeah. the value. Yeah. We just can't change the type. Does that make sense? Yep. We can change the value, but not the type. Here, this example is called explicit typing. So, same starts out with the same syntax, var y. So now y is going to be meaningful in every subsequent line in the code that we're about to write. But we have this added piece of syntax, this lovely gem, colon, and then a type afterwards. So 
This tells Swift that the variable y is going to be holding doubles for us. And then we start the process of initialization, where we give it its initial value. Does that make sense? Initialization, initial value. So bar y colon double equals 1. One line of code, so it's essentially happening at the same time. At the same time. Here, it's implicit because we're not actually using a type identifier. Here, it's explicit. And we're using a type identifier. We're using the name of the type to be very explicit to Swift. But does it read it like, okay, fair? Why that's the declaration, and then like say it's a double equals? So this is so everything. So this is the declaration. Everything to the left of the equals is okay. the declaration. So it is possible to declare a variable without initializing it. But in this case, it's very bad. Swift actually complains if we do that. There's a way around it that I'm going to show you towards the end if we get there. Or the beginning of the next class if we don't get there today. So this is how you declare, implicitly declare an integer, explicitly a, a variable that holds an integer. Explicitly declare a variable that holds a double. Explicitly declare a variable that holds a bool. Does that make sense? So this guy is easy. More than one letter, luckily enough, it makes code much readable. I guarantee that you write all your variables in such long, um, meaningful ways. It can only hold true or false. Down here, the syntax for constants is virtually the same, except for one notable difference. What's the difference? Between declaring this, declaring variables, and declaring constants, you notice that you can't change them. You cannot change them. What's the difference in syntax? Let. 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 This is the keyword that we use to create and initialize constants. So C. Anybody notice? Anybody recognize this number?